There we go. So uh, this is the uh, the tenth uh, online presentation for the Historical Society of St. Catharines, and uh, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Finney, who will introduce the speaker. Elizabeth. Thanks, John. And I guess everyone knows that our President Dave is not here tonight. I think he might be celebrating American Thanksgiving as far as we know. So it's uh, up to us. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce this evening's special guest, Peter Mulcaster. Peter is originally from the UK where he studied and trained as a professional engineer. He came to Canada in 1966 and spent his career working in Quebec for three years and then mostly in Toronto where he worked in computer and information technology for 35 years. Peter retired in 2011 and moved to Niagara-on-the-Lake where he took up an interest in local history. He has written a book, which is the subject of his presentation tonight. The book is titled Off to Paradise Grove, which I think is a lovely title. Um, Peter is a member of the Canadian Railroad Historical Asso Association Niagara Division. Just last week, Peter was notified that his book won the Canadian Railroad Historical Association's annual book award for 2020. This award came from the CRHA headquarters in Montreal. We congratulate Peter on this honor and we welcome him to this evening's meeting. Peter. All right, I'm just going to um, share my screen here. Uh, John, it says here that you've uh, disabled uh, participants uh, screen sharing. So I think you, uh, if I could ask you to turn that back on, please. How's that? Okay. All right. I think we've got it. <clears throat> All right. Um, so hello everyone, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, can everyone hear me uh, all right? Please. Yes. So I'll make a start. And um, here we have a, um, a photograph, a current photograph of uh, Niagara on the Lake. I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with the town. This is taken right in the center of the town looking uh, roughly uh, westward. And in the center of the Queen Street here, we have the uh, Cenotaph and off to the left, we have the, um, uh, the courthouse building, which was built in 1847. If we come along the street a little bit further uh, towards where the picture was taken, we have the main intersection there. Uh, and we're now standing at King Street looking where King Street crosses uh, Queen Street and looks down towards the uh, Niagara River where it um, joins the lake. Um, on the um, right here, we have Simcoe Park. And uh, on the other side of the street, on the left-hand side, we have um, the uh, apothecary, the Niagara Apothecary, which used to be a drugstore and is now a museum of pharmacology. This is the same view about a hundred years ago. So it was totally different. We had two railway lines running down the main street. The park was still there, Simcoe Park. This building over here was Coins Drugstore. The railway on the uh, right-hand side was a steam train line ran, run by uh, the Michigan Central Railroad. And here we have a steam train coming up from the dock, uh, picked up passengers from a steamship coming in, obviously from Toronto. And then on this side, we have a track belonging to the Niagara, St. Catharines and Toronto Railway which was an electrified railway. You can just make out the overhead wire here, which supplied the electricity. So at this time, Niagara-on-the-Lake was a railroad town, but it was state of the art. It was high tech at that time because uh, we had not only steam trains, we had an electric train as well. So tonight I'm going to um, cover 
the history, talk about early uh, development of, of rail uh, around the town and then as it came into the town, then talk about the electric railway. I want to touch on railway safety a little bit and then economic and strategic benefits, uh, industry that developed. And then the last part is um, legacy and what that means is what's left in town, what do we have left over. But first, a little bit of a history lesson. The predecessor to the, um, starting right at the top here, the predecessor to the um, steam railway that came into uh, Niagara on the Lake was the um, Erie and um, on Ontario Railroad, railroad which was a, a horse-drawn rail, railroad, which um, was founded by uh, John and a Alexander Hamilton, who were the sons of the Honorable um, uh, Robert Hamilton, who lived in uh, Queenston. And it was a just a, a railway drawn by horses, and uh, it was uh, really a wooden railroad. And what happened was that they nailed um, uh, strips of wrought iron on top of the wood to uh, make uh, so the, the wood didn't wear, wear out. The railway ran from um, uh, Queenston up the uh, escarpment and uh, roughly along current day Stanley Street down to Chippewa to the Welland River or, or Chippewa Creek. And um, then uh, from there, uh, passengers could take a, a ferry up the river to uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, the Hamilton brothers uh, obtained a charter in 1852 to convert it to steam, but at that time they ran out of money. So um, an entre railroad entrepreneur called Samuel Zimmerman um, uh, bought the railway uh, from them and uh, com completed it and converted it to steam. And um, it opened in July of 1854. And this was the third steam railway in uh, Ontario. And uh, at the same time, he also bought the uh, Niagara Harbor and Dock Company, which I should mention later on. Uh, there was a major breakthrough uh, for this railway because it then had an in, in March of 1855 when the Niagara Suspension Bridge opened. And this carried a, the Great Western Railway from Hamilton to Niagara Falls and then over the bridge to um, Niagara Falls, New York. So passengers coming from Niagara on the Lake could uh, connect to the USA at Niagara at Niagara Falls. Another railway entrepreneur in 1860, um, by the name of William Thompson, opened a railway from Fort Erie to Chippewa. So uh, passengers then from Toronto, uh, from Niagara on the Lake could then go down to uh, Fort Erie. Um, and then at this time also the uh, Erie and Ontario Railway started to have uh, financial difficulties, so it was purchased by William Thompson. He combined the two railways and renamed them the Erie and Niagara Railway. But almost as soon as he'd done that, he ran out of money and leased the whole thing to uh, the Great Western Railway um, to avoid going bankrupt. When their lease was, it was quite expected the Great Western Railway was going to purchase um, the branch up to Niagara on the lake, but uh, they did not. Um, and then in the end, uh, when the lease was up, the, uh, Canada Southern Railway purchased it and uh, it became part of the Canada Southern Railway network. Now, this is when things started to really change because the railway up to this point had been more or less just a backwater. Um, Canada Southern was a much bigger operation, had bigger, uh, more passengers and more advertising. Canada Southern ran all the way across Southern Ontario from Fort Erie uh, through uh, St. Thomas, which was its headquarters, all the way over to uh, Windsor, which is opposite uh, Detroit. So I would like to just talk about Samuel Zimmerman. He was born in the US. Uh, by 1842, he had come to Canada, but became rapidly a very wealthy um, entrepreneur, a railway entrepreneur. Um, he uh, actually was also involved in the um, Welland Canal. He was a contractor uh, from 1846 to 1849, and he built um, four locks on the second uh, Welland Canal. 
In uh, 1848, he married uh, Margaret Woodruff from St. David's, and they had two sons, uh, John and Richard. And um, uh, in, in 1849 to 1853, um, he became very much involved with the Great Western Railway, and this was the second steam railway, and he was responsible for building the railway from all the way from Hamilton to um, uh, Niagara Falls, and this opened in um, uh, December of 1853. Um, unfortunately, he, he died a, um, in a train uh, accident at the age of 42 in 1857, which was very, very unfortunate. But he was involved in many, many things. He was involved in railroads all the way up to Toronto and right up to um, Port Hope and um, in, in, into that area there. So, uh, and during this time, he became very wealthy, he owned lots of property. He uh, started a bank in uh, Niagara Falls and um, also uh, opened the Clifton House Hotel. Um, so why was this railway of interest? Um, as I said, initially there was a horse-drawn railroad that opened in uh, 1839. It went from Queenston down to Chippewa right here. Why was it of interest? Well, this is because um, in the United States in the uh, mid 1800s, railways developed much earlier than they did in Canada. Um, there were only two or three railways uh, by 1850 um, uh, in operating in Canada, whereas in the United States, they had developed much more rapidly. So passengers who wanted to travel uh, in the US from Toronto, they took a steamer across to um, across the lake, it stopped at, at, at Niagara on the lake, but also sailed up the river to Queenston. At Queenston, they got on the horse-drawn railway, went down to Chippewa, they got onto another uh, ferry, it went up the, up the river to Buffalo. And then in Buffalo, they could catch a train to the East Coast, Boston, New York, and they could also travel west. So that was the interest in this railway. It was opposed to some degree by William Merritt, who thought it was gonna be a competitor to the Welland Canal, but it really never was. It was just really a feeder line. So it was extended, as I said, steam um, in 1854, now all the way from Niagara on the lake to Chippewa, and then eventually um, uh, uh, all the way down here. And in, in 1873, a bridge opened uh, across the river here into Buffalo. So you could travel by train nonstop. Um, here are a couple of um, early publications pertaining to the Erie and Ontario Rail Railroad. Um, on the left, we have the opening notice, which talks about the trains. Um, and then on the uh, right hand side, we have a timetable, and you can see that um, it. it uh, it only cost two dollars to go from um, Buffalo to Toronto all the way. The uh, train journey from um, originally from uh, Niagara on the Lake to Chippewa took about an hour and uh, sometimes longer because the trains had to stop uh, for fuel. Um, the Erie and Ontario Railway wasn't a very big operation. It had two locomotives, um, just four passenger coaches, one, one baggage car, a box car, and uh, a, a few freight cars. Um, here is a very interesting uh, uh, watercolor, which shows um, the uh, uh, waterfront at Niagara on the lake in 1854. It's a little bit overemphasized, but it shows the railway coming down King Street and then curving and then going along the waterfront and it ended here in front of the uh, warehouse, which was built in 1834. But uh, remarkably, there's a number of landmarks on this um, watercolor, which um, luckily we still have in town. Here is Fort Mississauga, which was um, uh, just recently restored by the government of Canada last year. Here we have St. Andrew's Church. We have the courthouse right here. We have St. Mark's. 
We have St. Vincent de Paul. And interestingly, there's a lot of um, industrial buildings here which were owned by the Niagara Harbor and Dock Company where they built steamships, including this one in this picture. And later on, Samuel Zimmerman turned this enterprise into building uh, rail cars uh, for the railway. Uh, this is the earliest photograph I have of an actual steam train coming from uh, Niagara uh, on the lake. Um, it is uh, passing a stop which is called Falls View, and the trains would stop there so um, uh, tourists could uh, look out over and see the um, see the falls. Here's Horseshoe, there's American Falls, and just see the suspension bridge. Uh, in the background and just make out the Clifton House Hotel, which uh, was owned by um, Samuel Zimmerman. I believe this photograph was taken from probably one of the windows from the uh, Loretta Academy. Um, so I want to get back to the history lesson um, because um, Canada Southern, as I said, opened up the line to more tra traffic, to more people. Um, and then um, they, Canada Southern, got into a financial difficulty and in, in, in 1876. They were bought out by um, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he was a huge railway magnet in the United States, immensely rich. He owned the New York Central Railroad and many other railroads. And uh, so he bought Canada Southern and including the piece that came up to Niagara on the lake. So why did uh, Vanderbilt buy this Canadian railroad? Well, as I mentioned, the, the, the main line for Canada Southern ran from Fort Erie, which was now connected to Buffalo, and it ran all the way over Ontario to um, Windsor, which is opposite Detroit, and there was a ferry service to take the trains over to, to Detroit. Um, it was a strategic purchase for Vanderbilt because now his trains could just, uh, going from Buffalo to Detroit, they could just go across southern Ontario before they had to go all along um, the southern shore of Lake Erie, uh, Cleveland, uh, Toledo, and then up to um, Detroit and thereby he saved about 120 miles of, um, uh, of, of journey by purchasing this uh, railway. In, um, it, in, in uh, 1878, the Vanderbilts, in this case his sons, um, William Vanderbilt, um, they, they, they executed a proxy takeover of the Michigan Central Railroad. Michigan Central Railroad was in financial difficulties. Their shares were down. Um, the Vanderbilts purchased a lot of the uh, Michigan Central Railroad shares. And it was of interest to them because Michigan Central ran from Detroit. Their main line was from Detroit over to Chicago and most of all the other railways running in um, uh, Northern and Southern um, uh, Michigan. So it was a big operation. And as I said, they executed a proxy takeover. This means you, can, you, you buy enough shares so you can have enough votes and you convince a lot of other shareholders that the uh, existing uh, board of directors are incompetent and uh, the shareholders vote them out and then um, uh, in, they installed the Vanderbilts and they took over the railway. Um, another much more, uh, for those of you who may be interested in this, a much more modern example of this was a proxy takeover, which took place of CP Rail in uh, 2012. Um, CP wasn't doing very, very well. The shares were down and um, Bill Ackman of um, Pershing Capital Management um, took over CP Rail and they installed Hunter Harrison uh, as the CEO. And um, I think eventually the uh, CP shares went $60 up to about $200. Anyway, as part of this takeover, um, the Vanderbilts amalgamated uh, Canada Southern with Michigan Central. So Michigan Central ran the lines into, um, in, into Niagara on the lake. The heyday of the railway for Mich was, was from about 1880 up to about 1920. 
And then um, in 1926, at that time, the automobile started to have an effect. Passenger service declined. And um, so passenger service uh, with Michigan Central from Niagara on the lake was, was terminated. The railway was kept open as a freight line at that time. Um, from, there were about two freight trains a day, but eventually dwindled down to one a day and then one a week by the time it closed in 1859. So it just wasn't economical at that time. So here's some examples of the kind of coverage that the railway got when Michigan Central um, took it over because Michigan Central was now part of New York Central. So if it, it could advertise to customers um, you know, right throughout uh, Northeastern uh, United States as well. So uh, it talks about uh, trains here, three fast trains daily, um, and, and they stop from five to 10 minutes at the Falls View station. So this was a, obviously a tourist operation as well and uh, became um, very, very, very uh, popular. And as you can see on the right-hand side, Paradise Grove is mentioned. The banks of the Niagara River, beautifully located grove, ideal for picnic, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where the um, link to Paradise Grove comes. And then on the right-hand side, you can see a Michigan Central ticket and Paradise Grove here is an actual stop, an actual location that you could uh, go to. This ticket actually here was um, punched for 55 cents for a journey from Niagara Falls to Buffalo. So um, it seemed to be quite cheap to travel at that time. So here is a picture of actually one of the trains stopped at Falls View. You can see how nicely manicured the lawn is. They did a beautiful job. So passengers you get out of the train, look over and uh, see the falls. Um, I believe this building up here is part of the Loretto Academy. You can still get this view today um, if you go along uh, Stanley Street and then just turn east on uh, Livingstone Street it kind of ends about here. You can look out over the falls and you can look down this embankment here and uh, you can still see where the railroad used to run. Um, now I'm gonna to switch to where the, the, the railway uh, came into Niagara on the lake. This is a map from um, 1909. So just to familiarize you with the map, but you may not um, be aware of um, the town completely, but anyway, some of the main locations. Here is um, Queen Street right here. This would be the location of the courthouse. Here is Fort Mississauga. Here is Fort George. Here is Mississauga Street, the main street coming in. This area used to be a military reserve. It's now the golf course. The um, show festival theater would be roughly about here. Queen's Parade goes across here, which is now called the Common. There was a military reserve at that time called, and, and actually called um, uh, uh, Niagara, Camp Niagara. Um, so in red, I've indicated how the railway came into town. Um, it came in from a southerly direction from Niagara Falls. It split into two branches and um, this branch ended up by being the main branch came in like this and then along King Street and then down to the dock area where it could pick up passengers coming in steamers from Toronto. There was another branch which um, came in through across the country across John Street. And then you can just make out here the wording, it says Paradise Grove. So it was a wooded area to the east of the town, which is, um, a, a natural savanna type environment with many species of trees, many of which are mature oak trees. A very beautiful area. And there was a little spur here, a siding where they could park the passenger coaches where pa passengers could come and uh, spend the day. This extension here was added in about 1900 and it was called the Military Railway. And um, it, it's, it, it provided service for the, 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 the um, 
the, the military operations that took place here. There was another branch line that went over um, to the other side of town. There was something called a Shatakua uh, assembly, which was a um, sort of an organization of uh, that organized um, uh, educational holidays, uh, which uh, also had somewhat of a religious theme as well. Um, it existed for a short period. The assembly uh, was quite active, but it had its own little railway going over there um, to, to serve the folks that went there. Um, here is a, um, a detailed uh, um, map of the dock area. So the steamships would come in here, dock here, passage would get off at the station. Um, go to the station, they would pick up the train, and you can see the railway lines. It would um, head up towards town, it crossed a culvert. There was a turn, there was a turntable here, other railroad infrastructure, coal shed, engine house here. Um, and, and so, just as a matter of interest, this area was on a, this line was on a better 1% slope. And the trains would come down in uh, from Niagara Falls and it would stop here. They decouple the locomotive and put the locomotive on this spur towards the turntable. The conductor would then release the brake and the passenger coaches would coast down to the station like this. The reason we're doing this, they decoupled the locomotive. They could move it over to the turntable turn the locomotive around, put it back on the main track, it would reverse down, ready to pick up the passenger coaches um, to uh, leave. Um, you'll see here quite a few industrial buildings that were associated with um, Samuel Zimmerman's uh, um, Niagara Car Works, which build, uh, built railway ri rolling stock in the um, late 1850s and early 1860s. What I'd like to do now is to try to take you on a, um, a virtual journey um, uh, of what it would have been like to travel on the railway. So you would have uh, traveled um, across Lake Ontario. So here's the Cayuga uh, leaving uh, Toronto, the Eastern Gap. Um, it would have taken about uh, two hours to cross the uh, 35 miles across uh, Lake Ontario. And here you would arrive at Niagara Lake, and you can see the little station here. Uh, it also served as a ticket office for the uh, steamship company. You can see here there is uh, a train waiting uh, to take you further on your journey. This is the warehouse here, which has uh, been a constant feature in, in the dock area. Uh, then uh, we're now looking down on the on the uh, on the dock. Um, here, as I said, is the station. You can just make out the locomotive here with the train and the track leading up towards the town. Here we are in front of the train, fine crew assembly assembled. I, I, I've only been able to identify one of these people. This is um, uh, Edward Keith here. He lived uh, in town on Delater Street. He was employed by Michigan Central as a, um, a fireman and later got promoted to a locomotive engineer. As we leave the dock area, this is Melville Street here. We pass one of the um, long gone, well, not too long gone um, uh, landmarks of the uh, town, the Lake House View Hotel, which existed for many years and unfortunately burnt down um, in 1998. And as we come up from the dock area, we come up a um, about a 1% grade slope because um, when you get up to King Street and Queen Street, it was quite a bit higher. So this is the embankment, and then you cross the bridge over um, Delater Street. This is Delater Street here. This water trough here, which was used to water horses, is still there today. This bridge here was originally a wooden trestle, and this was all a wooden trestle along here, but it was filled in in the 1870s, and then it was replaced by a, um, a steel bridge with masonry abutments in the 1880s. Um, residents of, of the town from the railroad days always referred to this as the trestle, never the bridge, because it was originally a wooden trestle. 
here we are back up on uh, uh, King Street, crossing Queen Street. And we know this is um, very close to 1920 because this, this is a Ford Model T from 1920. Um, and now we'll see some scenes of us leaving town. Here we are, we have passed um, uh, uh, Queenston, we have passed just past the St. David's station, and we're crossing over York Road, which runs between St. David's and Queenston, and climbing up the escarpment. Now, this is quite a steep slope. It's about a 2% slope. That is about as much as you want with a steam train. So it took a very long route up the escarpment and this line ran all the way over to the St. David's Gorge and then swung around and then swung south into um, Niagara Falls and then on to um, Chippewa. And here we are crossing uh, Chippewa Creek. Um, and we can see the train heading southwards. I mentioned that the uh, train, the line was uh, referred to um, locally as the uh, Paddy Miles line or the Paddy Miles Express. Paddy Miles was a, um, an Irish immigrant. He was born in 1841, immigrated to the United States. Uh, but um, by 1864, he was in Canada and uh, he got a job as the train's conductor. Now, this would have been with the Erie and Niagara Railway at the time. And um, he uh, was known for his um, sense of humor, looking after customers, looking after the baggage. In fact, he was the general go-to person to make the railway run and was very much uh, um, very helpful to customers. And sometimes it was uh, heard that uh, he was able to produce food and cook meals on the train journey. And he must have been incredibly successful because he lasted through three employers because after the Erie and Niagara Railway it was bought by Canada Southern and then by Michigan Central, they all kept him on. So he worked for 38 years and finally retired in 1902. He was a local man. Um, he married Maria Manafort and they uh, lived in a house on uh, King Street. And then here we are finally arriving at um, uh, uh, Union Depot Railroad Station in, uh, in Buffalo, New York. I actually knew somebody who took this journey. Um, I had a, um, an acquaintance in Toronto, unfortunately passed away um, in 2018 at age 103. But um, when he was a boy in the early 20s, um, he, he uh, used to take the, the, the steamer over in the summer to Niagara on the lake and then took the train down. He would get off on the other side of the bridge in, in New York at Black Rock, where he would be met with his uncle and aunt uncle and aunt, and he would spend the summer with them in Orchard Park, New York. So I asked him what he thought of the train journey, and he said the boat was fine, but the train was rather slow. So anyway, at least I, I had someone met someone who traveled on the train. I'm actually about um, halfway through my slides, and I don't know whether um, it would be appropriate if anyone has any questions, I can stop and we could have a brief um, answer a few questions if anyone has any burning questions or I can just move on. Um, what would you like to do, John? Okay. All right, I'm going to move on then. Here I'm going to switch to electricity um, and uh, talk about how the electric railway came into Niagara on the lake. Uh, the NSNT, this is a map which shows the NSNT, a network, the Niagara, St. Catharines and Toronto Railway, had its origins in um, St. Catharines um, in uh, 1879. Uh, it was the St. Catharines Street Railway. It was a horse-drawn railway and uh, operated as an urban railway in St. Catharines. Uh, by 1887, it had become electrified and um, had ex and then expanded through and, 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 and took on different names, expanded to Thorold 
and uh, to uh, Port Dalhousie. Um, in, uh, uh, there was also a steam line going over to Niagara Falls. There was also an urban um, electric railway service in Niagara Falls. In 1899, a company was formed called the Niagara and St. Catharines and Toronto Railway, I should refer to it as the ns &T, uh, to buy up these enterprise, these different railways and, and amalgamate them into one single network. So they purchased this steam line here and electrified it, uh, therefore having a link to Niagara Falls. They then also purchased this urban um, streetcar service in Niagara Falls. So they had a service from, from Port Dalhousie through um, uh, St. Catharines to Niagara Falls. They later then extended the, the railway down south to Font Hill, Welland, and onto uh, Port Colburn. And then in, in 1913, they extended the line into uh, Niagara on the lake. So um, it was, uh, and, and also I want to point out, it linked up to another electric railway called the NFPNR, the Niagara Falls Park and River Railway, which ran from Chippewa to uh, Queenston, and then later on became the Great Gorge Route. Uh, when it crossed over the Queenston uh, Lewiston suspension bridge and traveled at um, water level all along the Niagara River up to Niagara Falls, New York, and then back across to um, Niagara Falls, Ontario. This, this was quite a spectacular railway and very, very popular with uh, tourists. But what was uh, still amazes me that we had this amazing um, uh, um, uh, interurban electric railway network covering the um, uh, uh, you know the, this part of the Niagara Peninsula. It went from uh, north to south and connected all the major uh, communities. I'm just going to touch on the NFPNR for a little bit. Here's a picture of it in uh, Queenston. Um, it, the steamers that came over from Toronto docked at uh, Niagara on the lake, but then they sailed up river to Queenston and docked there and passengers could connect with these um, streetcars and as I said, travel back to Niagara Falls or take the Great Gorge route. Um, I'm not going to cover this too much because there was a wonderful book published by Peter Watson called The Great Gorge Route which has many pictures and maps in it, which describes the operation of this, this railway. But here you can see uh, the Mont Brox Monument. You can see St. Saviour's Church here in uh, Queenston. So in eight, as I mentioned, in 1913, uh, the NSNT extended into Niagara on the lake and uh, passenger service opened in, uh, 19, in December of 1913. And it was a wonderful service. There were the, the service, uh, there were 18 trains a day. Uh, it ran from seven o'clock in the morning to midnight. The journey took 45 minutes from downtown St. Catharines to downtown uh, 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 Niagara on the lake. And uh, it, it was just, uh, it ran on the hour, every hour, as I said, uh, and uh, it was utilized by people who uh, commuted to work in St. Catharines. It was utilized by uh, school children for uh, high school courses that weren't available in Niagara-on-the-Lake. They could go to St. Catharines. People would go on a shopping expedition, shopping trip to St. Catharines. It was a, a wonderful arrangement and, um, and, and operated but uh, until 1931, where, of course, the, uh, the competition from the automobile had a major effect. And by then, uh, the line was not um, uh, economically uh, viable. So I'm going to um, just look at a couple of maps and see the, the route that the railway took. Um, it started, here's, here's the line right here. You can see it running along here. It started at um, you know, Geneva Street and Wellen Avenue where the main station was. It ran down uh, Wellen Avenue, Niagara Street, Facer Street, and then there was a right of way down 
to Lakeshore Road, Port Weller, McNabb, Coleman's Corners, Formal Creek Road. Then it ran a little bit north of Hunter Road, cross cross the uh, Niagara Stone Road at, um, at um, Niven Road, and then turned and then ran into town uh, along Queen Street, uh, King Street, I mean. Here's a, a railway map again, uh, showing the railways about 1920. The red is still the steam and the green now is the, um, is the NSNT. So it ran parallel all the way down King Street. It didn't go, um, it just ran past um, Queen Street a little bit, halfway between Predo Street and um, Queen Street and the station for it was about here. Originally, NSNT wanted to bring it in through Mississauga Street and, and turn it, bring it along Queen Street. They thought they would have to pick up more passengers that way, but the town council wouldn't allow that. And so it, uh, it, it, it was, 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 they were told to run it along King Street, which still must have caused a, a number of uh, traffic and uh, pedestrian problems, but there it was. Um, I'm going to just uh, also take you on a very short journey um, with the ns &T cars. Here is what looks like to be an excursion, um, a summer excursion, because there's the main uh, streetcar here, but it's towing four trailers loaded with passengers. We just see the drugstore over here. This is uh, Queen Street running just here. And here we are uh, now leaving town, uh, going out along uh, King Street. Uh, then we'll, we'll cross over uh, uh, um, Niagara Stone Road. This is the NSNT station right here. This is Market Street right here. And then um, we're now quite a bit out of town. We're crossing a, a trestle, which crossed uh, Eight Mile Creek. Uh, at uh, McNabb, we're crossing, and this area has now been filled in, but it's crossing McNabb. And then here we are coming in towards um, uh, uh, St. Catharines, and this would have been in uh, about 1920 when they were building the uh, Lock One on the Fourth Welland Canal. So the um, the, the, the lifting bridge is not yet installed. And whilst they were building a canal, they built this uh, wooden trestle across the canal. So I'm going to talk a little bit about railway safety. Um, up to about 1850, railway safety wasn't a big problem. There were a few trains on, on the tracks. They usually ran during the daytime. If one broke down, um, it wasn't too bad because there probably was another train to the following day anyway. Trains were not that heavy. They were quite light. But after 1850, they started to get more concentrated. Tra trains ran at night like this one did. Um, they were much heavier. Um, tracks were not necessarily well, built well enough to be able to hold the, um, the, 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 the weight of the, the newer locomotives. And um, this accident occurred at the Desjardins Canal in, uh, just outside Hamilton, where a Great Western train coming from Toronto to Hamilton um, crashed through the bridge uh, crossing the Desjardins Canal. And what was resolved that happened here was that just before the locomotive got to the bridge, which was a wooden structure, uh, its front axle broke and the front, axle, the front wheels uh, came off the track and were just um, disengaged really from the locomotive. But um, as it came to the bridge, which is a wooden structure, it just uh, tore apart the structure of the bridge and then crashed into the uh, frozen canal at that time. Some 60 people died, lost their lives, including Samuel Zimmerman, who was in the last passenger coach. Now, he died at the age of 42 in 1857. And so this had, uh, going back to the railway, which was run into Niagara on the lake at that time by Erie in Ontario. It lost his support, it lost his promotional, it lost his financial backing. And uh, from that time on, 
1863 when it was purchased by William Thompson, it really got into financial difficulty. So it had an immediate effect um, on the railway in Niagara on the lake. And uh, it was a, a, you know, a, a sad loss for him dying such at an early, early age. Um, there was a railway accident locally, which I have photographs of um, 1913 uh, at, at um, just between Queenston and Niagara on the lake, a Michigan Central uh, train derailed. Someone had tampered with the switch and the train went off the tracks. Um, uh, the, um, there was one casualty, the fireman, Clarence Parker, died the day later um, from his uh, in, uh, serious inju injuries and he's actually buried at St. Mark's uh, Church. Uh, I had mentioned earlier the NFPNR railway, and there was a serious accident on this in Queenston in um, 1915. Uh, this picture is not uh, to do with the accident, but it shows car 684, and it was car 685, which actually crashed. Um, uh, the car started at the top of the, uh, by uh, uh, Brock's monument. It started to rain and a large uh, crowd of people fearing they would get wet jumped on the uh, train. The train was uh, had a capacity of 80 people. Some 160 people got on the train. As it went down the slippery tracks, which is almost a 6% um, gradient here, um, the uh, overhead uh, trolley came off and uh, the uh, the street, the car lost its power, therefore the uh, dr driver could not put it into reverse. And then further down, it had a brake failure. It managed to get round to th 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 um, two of the curves, but on the third curve, it derailed and uh, rolled down an embankment and 15 people died in the accident. And about 90 were injured in, in all. So it wasn't a very... Um, pleasant uh, situation. Now to talk a little bit about economic and strategic benefits, um, travel and tourism, and I'll go through agriculture, fishing, and then industrial things, and, and, and then end up by um, uh, talking about the military. So um, as I mentioned, the heyday of the railways was from about 1880 to about 1820. Niagara on the lake had eight major hotels and of course many many um, other uh, you know uh, bed and breakfasts and overnight uh, lodgings that people were going to. The best known one was the Queen's Royal Hotel um, which um, sat uh, just on the banks of the, um, the Lake Ontario. I'd mentioned that there was a, a railway um, going over to the Chautauqua Assembly. This is the Chautauqua Hotel, which was quite substantial. There was another hotel in the Chautauqua area. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So on summer's day, um, the steamers from Toronto would bring hundreds and hundreds of people over for activities such as tennis, uh, swimming, uh, hiking, horse riding, bowling. They could go boating and do all, uh, a number of things which uh, made it very attractive. Here's a picture of um, Paradise Cove. You can see the sort of pleasant wooded area. It looks very much like this today. There was a carousel there for a short period of time. There was a, um, a pavilion there where there was um, apparently lager beer was served and there was dancing. So, um, uh, uh, and I hope it was only on Sunday, Saturdays that that happened, not on Sundays. Um, and so it was very popular for excursions coming up from uh, Buffalo. And it was advertised people come up from Buffalo for the day and spend uh, the day in Paradise Grove. They could go over to the river and swim. They could, local boys had uh, rowing boats and would take them out uh, for little trips um, on the river for 10 cents an hour. Um, 
as you know, River on the Lake and the whole area is blessed with this uh, our, our, our subclimate where we can grow soft fruits such as cherries and apricots, nectarines, peaches, and grapes. And um, here's the railway coming from Queenston into Niagara on the Lake. I point this out there were two spurs coming off, one at Larkin Road and the other one at um, uh, line six. This is for the Larkin farm, and this was for the um, Fisher farm. There were also, also spurs coming off the NSNT track. There was particularly one at the Hunter farm, just off Hunter Road. But um, this will give you some idea of the um, operations that took place. This is in the 1930s. Then we're here we have, we're at the height of the uh, peach uh, harvesting season. And in this lower picture at the Fisher Farm, we have um, six uh, refrigerator uh, cars here. So, you know, these cars took an enormous amount of fruit. So it gives you some idea of the scale of the operations that um, took place um, during the season of the fruit, fruit growing industry. And of course, of railways facilitated the growth of these industries, which then led to, of course, fruit canning as well. So we had four um, canning factories in and around Niagara on the lake. We had the Union Jack Company, which used to occupy the parking lot of the um, Prince of Wales Hotel. We had the Del High uh, Canning Company on the uh, dock area, which was later taken over by um, uh, can Canadian canners. And they moved up to um, John Street and they had this uh, large operation which employed almost 200 people um, at John Street. This building now, of course, has now been converted and this is a pillar and post hotel. There was another canning company in St. David's and another one at uh, Four Mile Creek. Um, fishing was also very big, you know, uh, before the railways came, fishing was just locally. People, um, the fishermen who caught their fish couldn't really send it anywhere because they didn't have the transportation or the facilities. But once the railways came, then the fishing industry expanded. There were 20, at its peak between, um, from 1880 to about 1920, there were 22 families in Niagara on the lake uh, doing commercial fishing. You see some of the buildings here, they were fishing huts or they were fishing, um, uh, uh, markets where they would gut and pack and ice the fish. And I've uh, just showed this photo down here because here's a refrigerator van. And at the peak of the industry, there were two vans a day going out with uh, fish. And Lake Ontario was a wonderful source, had been a wonderful source, an abundant source of fish. <laughs> And uh, the, they caught, you know, whitefish, sturgeon, salmon, trout, lake herring, and they were packaged at the peak. And here's a refrigerator car. There were two for refrigerator cars a day went out 500 tons a year uh, in the um, when, when it was uh, doing well. But eventually it got overfished. So by 1920, it started to decline. By 1925, Output went was down to about five tons a year, and by the end of the 1920s, it was almost uh, down to nothing. So, as a result of overfishing, um, and also pollution, destruction of habitat, um, invasive species, invasive species um, destroyed the uh, fishing industry on Lake Ontario, and it has never, never recovered. Um, here's a photo of what was called the Niagara Car Works, which, going back to Samuel Zimmerman, um, was uh, it was originally used for building steamships, and some very well-known steamships were built here, including two when Zimmerman owned it. One was called um, the Peerless, and the other one was called, of course, the Zimmerman. But um, in the mid 1850s, he converted it over so it could build rolling stock for the railways, mostly freight cars. 
at its peak, um, it built, they built a hundred rail cars a year and employed a, a hundred people. And through his connections, and as I said, he was involved in railways, the Great Western Railway, which is the main railway from Toronto to Hamilton to Niagara Falls at that time, and railways up to Coburg. He had lots of connections, so he could sell these, he could sell this rolling stock, he could keep this in business. But when he died in 1857 in the, the accident de Jardin Canal, it kind of declined and, and fizzled out. And by the mid 1860s, it had um, uh, died off. And today, all of these buildings are gone. There's no sign of them whatsoever. The only building left is the venerable um, uh, a warehouse, which is still left there. Um, Sand dredging was another huge operation which took place from um, about 1915 to the um, early 1990s. Um, and uh, the sand in the Niagara River was just the right consistency for making um, cement, uh, sorry, making kind of concrete. And of course, when it was dredged out of the river, it was washed by, uh, by, by, by uh, water, so it was perfectly clean and ready to use. So at, at various times, there were up to four dredgers working away, taking the sand out of the um, river. And, and uh, it, there was a period in 1921, which coincided with some of the final stages of building of the Adam Cernanbeck uh, generating station. And then where they were taking four to 5,000 tons of sand a day out of the river. And there were uh, 15 to 20 um, freight trains going through the town a day um, to uh, take sand to the generating station for its construction for pouring of concrete for the um, station and for the power canal. And all this dredging was, there was no environmental control over it. It irreparably changed the flow of the, the uh, river into Lake Ontario. And uh, as I said, it finally stopped in uh, 1990. There was a, uh, a plant that um, uh, made uh, cement called the Usher Cement Works in the Niagara Escarpment. Uh, there was a naturally occurring uh, layer of uh, natural cement. So as the railway went from St. David's up the escarpment towards Niagara Falls, um, they mined into the escarpment. They mined the um, naturally occurring cement and uh, put it in firing kilns, uh, fired it, and then uh, milled it, and then loaded it into uh, 300 pound barrels and uh, loaded them onto these um, freight cars and shipped it out. The, this plant pr produced about 45 tons of, some, of uh, cement a day uh, up till about um, uh, 1905. Unfortunately, this, this cement took 24 hours to cure and then uh, Portland cement was uh, invented, which took six hours to cure. So they went out of business, although this was a far superior product. I um, want to talk about the, the military, um, the common area which exists today was a military camp called the Niagara camp. Um, it um, uh, started off in the late 1800s, but became very important in the early 1900s, and then very strategic for the First World War. Niagara on the Lake was perfectly suited. It had these wild, these wide open areas for military training. It was, it had, if you, it had two methods of rail transport, both steam and electric. It had the steamships uh, coming over from Toronto. So from a transportation standpoint in that era, it was perfectly suited to um, uh, act as a military camp. And indeed it did. Recruits came in, they trained for 14 weeks and then they were shipped out. So the logistics were 
uh, uh, incredible here. Of the 619,000 military personnel Canada sent over to Europe in the First World War, 80,000 of these uh, recruits came through for training at um, Niagara on the Lake. So at any time this camp there was about 18,000 um, recruits training to be soldiers on the site. So the transportation in and out, logistics and material and equipment coming in and going out was enormous. And you can see some of the um, uh, uh, tr troops here, boarding trains. This is actually uh, John Street right here. And the train track was over here and the camp was over on this side over here. So uh, there must have been a lot of people, as I said, about 80,000 um, recruits and then soldiers came through the camp. Now just going to come to the last part and I'm going to talk about the legacy or what's left over. So we look at the dock area. We have two buildings which are currently, or main buildings which are left over, the warehouse and the American hotel and um, infrastructure things, the culvert, the remains of the turntable are there, and there are some remains of the engine house, which we'll take a look at. So here is the dock, dock. here is the warehouse, which was built in 1834, but you can see now the whole dock area is now uh, owned and run by the Niagara uh, sailing club, and uh, they have uh, reused the the, the, the um, warehouse is now their clubhouse, so it's been well used and taken care of. The uh, building itself is um, very very well built from an inside standpoint. Here's the American Hotel. It's now called the um, G George the Third Inn. Um, so those are the only two remaining main remaining buildings. We look at the infrastructure. There was a culvert that was went over a little stream. Uh, this is what it looked like before it was restored in nineteen uh, in two thousand and eighteen by the town. They have an ongoing restoration project going in this area, so we're very thankful they've done a beautiful job in restoring it back. It was getting some water damage on the other side. Here is the turntable, all that remains of it. There's only about half the stones of the outer uh, foundation wall. I've attached a photograph. This is not Niagara on the lake, but it gives you some idea of what it would have looked like. Here's the outer foundation wall here. It would have had a bridge in the middle and it would have been you know, hollow and dug out. This got filled in, the bridges disappeared. And about half the stones, it seems, have been dug up for a sewer repair and never returned. So. Um, we're, this is all we really see today. And in the background here, uh, in the summer, this is a, becomes a flower garden, which is um, uh, uh, we're kindly um, maintained by one of the local residents. Here we have the um, what's left of the um, engine house. Right, there's a line that the, here is where the turntable would have been, and a, a line came up to the engine house. The engine house was originally much bigger, it was about 40 foot wide and 75 foot long. It was wide enough for two locomotives, and on the on this side there was a repair pit, and we just see the foundation of the repair pit here. This was hollow, hollowed out down to about six feet and there were some steps leading down here. So mechanics would go down the steps and work on the underneath of the rail of the uh, locomotive. Um, there was a, a volunteer group formed earlier this year to restore the rails, which fitted on top of the uh, repair pit. And um, this work was actually completed. These rails did not exist a year ago, but they were, um, kindly, very kindly installed by PGM Rail Services and great thanks to PGM Rail Services for installing these rails. These rails are period rails from 1902 and, and match the type 
and weight of rails that would have been used at this time. So we've had a little bit of a restoration here. The um, perhaps the best um, item in town is the NSNT um, station. Um, here we have the old photograph. We can see the station right here. Miraculously, it was not not um, knocked down as many buildings seem to get knocked down uh, or demolished um, over time, but this stayed on. It, it was used for various businesses and shops over the period of time and stayed basically intact and then was restored um, in 2009 by local interests and now has been converted into a coffee house. And um, they've done a beautiful job and, and restored it to um, uh, they're as best they can to the original colors and um, it's worth going inside to see what a fine job they've done. And last but not least, uh, Paradise Grove is alive and well. Um, this is a photograph from uh, this spring, which um, shows one of the footpaths going through Paradise Grove with many ma mature um, oak trees in view. and. Um, and there is a there is a couple of signs uh, of where the railway was, but um, it's not immediately apparent. So that is um, my final slide. But just to say, um, in case I missed anything, um, and thank you very much for your time. In case I missed anything, it's in the book um, and uh, 143 pages and lots of pictures. Um, if you're interested in it, it's um, available for sale. Contact me by email. There is also a Kindle electronic version available. If um, you live locally in Niagara on the lake or I come to St. Catharines quite often, um, I would undertake to uh, hand deliver them. Um, and uh, uh, if you live out of the area, then a postage would be involved, but um, do contact me at my email and uh, I can help you out. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, is there any questions for Peter at this time? People can uh, unmute their microphones on the bottom left-hand side of the meeting. So there's a little microphone there, just click it to unmute yourself. Peter, can I make a comment? Uh, it's John Finney speaking. Yeah. I was uh, absolutely fascinated by your uh, discussion of the electrified railway for, that ran from St. Catharines uh, through McNabb to Niagara on the lake. Um, even today, they, in the news, they were talking about the uh, fact that the Ontario government and their past promises had said they would think about electrifying the railways in Ontario, which is a, uh, a step in the direction of global warming corrections. But that's uh, a dream in somebody's eye, I guess. But it's fascinating to think that they had that back in that period of time and managed to run a train that ran every hour on the hour. Yes. That's incredible. Yes, I, I've had many comments about this. This is, uh, was an incredible network. And um, it nearly got connected to Hamilton. There was a, um, the, the NS&T had a charter to extend their line to uh, Hamilton, which they never did um, because of financial reasons. But um, the Hamilton, Grimsby and Beanswill Electric Railway ran a line out from Hamilton through Grims through Stony Creek, Grimsby, Beamsville. It got as far as Vineland at Victoria Avenue and stopped. And they also had a charter to bring it into St. Catharines. But um, the problem was, was finding the money to build some sort of structure to cross the um, 20 mile creek which um, uh, the 20 mile Creek ravine, which was a problem. But um, we were very, very close. As I said, um, electric railway came to Vineland. And um, so that was almost within spitting dif distance of uh, St. Catharines. 
So but we, we had an amazing network and there were some amazing possibilities, but uh, thanks to the automobile, it just um, gradually over time, NSNT had to shrink their operation, make it smaller and smaller until finally, I think their last train ran, uh, and, and even that was a freight train in and around St. Catharines, and that was in, in 1960. And uh, since then, it's, it's basically all gone. Just, just as a side comment, Peter, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because you're more of a railway historian than I am. But I believe the electrified railway in Ontario was one of the main reasons why Ontario ended up with 25 cycle AC power that was developed uh, in the early part of the 20th century. I think it was because back in the day, they, they hadn't developed technology that allowed them uh, to, the power that ran electrified railways came from rotary converters, I believe. Yeah, I you're, believe you're right. It came from rotary converters, but the, um, the uh, actual power on the um, SN NS&T was 600 volt DC. Yes. So, so they took the power coming from um, uh, Niagara Falls and converted it. And you're right, it was, um, it was 110, 25 cycle. And they, through rotary converters or other means, they converted it to uh, 600 volt DC. Okay. Uh, the actual origins, from what I can understand, of the 25 cycles was um, the industrial machinery, industrial electric motors um, at, the, at the end of the 1900s operated on 25 cycles. And um, so most of the power generated was 25 cycles until we gradually converted to 60 cycles. But it was the actual electric motors that were used in industry that were wound to run up 25 cycles that created the need originally for 25 cycle AC electricity. Okay, thank you. You're talking about my next project, actually. <laughs> What is your next project? Well, I'm, I'm interested in um, hydroelectric generation and um, I'm interested in uh, looking at the history of um, the development of hydroelectricity in Niagara, particularly um, Sir Adam Beck one, because it was the world's first um, mega hydroelectric project. And it's been running now, it opened and started producing power in 1922. And so it's been running for a hundred years. Next year will be its hundredth anniversary of running, producing um, renewable uh, energy for a hundred years, uh, very efficiently and very effectively. I think it's an amazing achievement. So I'm interested in that and the history of how they built it. And uh, so I'm trying to do some work on that. All right. Um where is the, uh, you showed the old turntable. Yes. Where is that exactly? In so room? here is, well, um, are you familiar with the dock area? Or yeah. are you yes. familiar where, where the marina is? Yes, yes. So this is Melville Street. Right. And this is this, uh, as I said, was the American Hotel. This is where the jet boat tours used to take off from. Right, yeah. And then you go right down to the front here. Now, this is called um, River Beach Drive now, where the railway used to run. And then there was a little road leading up from here called Turntable Way. So it's at the corner of River Beach Drive and turntable way and you'll see the turntable and there's a sort of a, there's a plaque there we're interested in trying to get a permanent plaque here and if you work along the road roadway it stops here and then you'll see the culvert right there and you can walk right over it and just up here this leads into the later street is the foundation for the engine house all right Got next it. next street up here is ricardo street right here right okay Okay, right, thanks. 
figured that's where it was and just off to later there. Yes. Any more questions, anyone? No more questions, I don't see any hands. Gail, do you have your hand up? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm not able to use a chat. <laughs> I'm just not technically skilled enough. And I was more concerned about the, the woodland area where Paradise Grove is along King Street, because we used to know um, people that lived in there. And is there any development that you know of uh, Peter, that it's going to happen in that area. <laughs> um, well, why don't I go back to the map? It's just that I'm as part, part of the historical society and interested in heritage. I really would like to know that that's going to stay preserved. Well, you see, it's been encroached. I, I don't know of any new development, but it's already been encroached upon because here is the Shaw Festival Theatre. Right. Okay. Here they built the um, Niagara Parks donated to the town or donated to Ontario government land here for the Niagara on the Lake Hospital, which is going to close down and they're going to redevelop it. Um, there are, there is, there are a couple of um, retirement communities which have been built in here. Yes, yes. Land which was given by um, Parks Commission to um, the town. So th th there is a little industrial place in here as well. But I don't know of any more development that's going to take place, but you never know. The trouble is it's already been encroached upon. There have been precedents that have been set. And, you know, if someone will come forward and say, yeah, we want a new this or a new yes. retirement home. But so far, this whole area is still much. It's now called the Common, of course, and Paradise Grove is over here. Um, it's still very much um, natural, untouched. There's walking paths through it, a lot of mature trees. It's very beautiful. And yeah, like you, I hope that no one can right. ever touch it. Right. But thank, thank, yeah. someone thank finds something. Thank, thank you for that, because yeah. we're all hopeful to just sort of keep as much yes. open public land available yes. as possible. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions, anyone? Well, I'd like to thank Peter very much. Um, this is so interesting. Uh, my husband, John, and I spend frequently go to Niagara on the Lake probably a couple times a week. And we walk along King Street, especially. And we love to see that boulevard and imagine where those trains were. And now, you know, thanks to your photos and maps, we can see what that was all about. And um, the whole peripheral really history that you showed and the geography and all the influences that we hadn't, that I hadn't really thought about before. Very interesting. And um, congratulations again on your book Thank and you. everyone saw how they can get it. <laughs> and uh, what else can I say? I, I believe this program will be on YouTube. Is that right, John? It will be recorded and put onto YouTube. Yeah, so yeah. I just I just wanted to have that as part of our announcements. Okay, uh, well, that's all I have to say. Thank you again very much, Peter. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was really a, an interesting, uh, real, an, an interesting picture of early Niagara and and then the rail network that connected it as all, and you could see everything from you know, getting the peaches out and getting people in their daily lives, getting the kids to school, getting tourists in. It really was a wonderful uh, time, you know, 100, 150 years ago or so. Um, so a very fascinating um, presentation, Peter, and it will be on YouTube. And as I said at the, at the start, this is the 10th in our series of recorded historical society presentations on Zoom. Uh, they are recorded and put onto YouTube, so any of our earlier lectures and this one will be uh, visible on the Historical Society channel on YouTube. So all you have to do is go to youtube.com 
type in Historical Society of St. Catharines and you'll see uh, all, of the, all of the videos of the lectures that we've had in the past. This one will be up probably within the next uh, oh, 48 hours. Um, I would also like to say that uh, membership in the Historical Society, which supports our work to increase the knowledge and appreciation of history in the St. Catharines area, uh, includes maintaining the website, the quarterly newsletters, and our lecture series. So I'm just giving you a friendly reminder to renew your membership for 2022. Uh, the membership year goes according to the calendar. So 2022 memberships will be due starting in January. It's only $15 for a single membership and $20 for a family. And the directions on how to uh, join the society or to renew your membership are on our website, which is stcatharineshistory.ca. And there's no periods in there uh, other than the .ca. So stcatharineshistory.ca. Uh, and so we will be taking a brief break the month of December. We won't have a presentation, so we're returning in January. So that's only two months away. And that'll be with Brian Narhi speaking on the mill races in St. Catharines. We've got Dr. Dean Elling, Dr. Ian Ellingham, uh, Understanding Ugly, the Human Response to Buildings in the Environment. And in March, we've got David Hemmings, Was Your Grandmother a British Home Child? So a real variety of, of interesting historical presentations coming up in the new year. We hope to see you then. So thanks everybody for joining us tonight and thank you for uh, becoming an, a Historical Society member. Thank you everyone. Bye now. Good night. Thank Bye. Thanks Good again, night. Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.